So, no waiting around here. Representative Jack Kingston, a Congress feller who no longer represents all of us. Now, nah, he bailed on us. He represents for Moody Air Force Base over the Atlantic Ocean. He's on the uh, on the horn with us. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Frank. I, I actually was run out of town. Um, I'm not embarrassed by it. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm frankly just used to it. You know, I get run out of... <laughs> Yeah, and then counties have had enough, and they just say, all right, let's get rid of this guy. <laughs> they hurled you at – well, uh, we're sorry about that. We do uh, appreciate calling in because obviously our listening area and you overlap that, and you're a friend of the show. So uh, just want to check with you this morning and say Happy New Year, as always, to you, sir. Well, same to you. I hope you had some good holidays. I'm still trying to work off that extra five pounds that I picked up somewhere. No, you're an amateur. I put on ten. Let, let's get, let's get to the news of the day. Let's go ahead and start with the big news. Out of New Hampshire, everybody's running. All the indications are happening. The problem with New Hampshire, that I, I used to live there for about six months on a consulting gig. It's small. It's tiny. Demographically, overwhelmingly white, but it has this huge era of self-importance. I, I'm not asking you to pick a winner or loser on this, but does New Hampshire have any... I mean, I know it has input. Does it have the weight that it did previously, or is everyone who survives basically going on to South Carolina and the Southern folks will decide who the nominee is? Well, I I hope that its importance has just diminished. I hope Iowa's and South Carolina's importance have dim- dis- diminished as well. However, there are a tremendous amount of the media. You know, I you, you always get, oh, here's, the, here's these people at the coffee shop. Let's interview them and see what they think. And, you know, we don't know what the heck those people are, you know, what their mindset is. Why, why should we really care? Um, and yet the media makes sure that Iowa, South Carolina, and New Hampshire set the tone for the rest of us and eliminate a lot of the candidates. Tim Pawlenty dropped out early. Michelle Bachman, Rick Perry may be gone um, uh, when South Carolina's over with. Uh, so to me... Uh, one of the great, great sayings I heard politically was, as goes Iowa, there goes Iowa. However, <laughs> the truth of the matter is they still get uh, the candidate's name and face out there. And so, uh, but, you know, to me, part of the primary process, I, I think the good thing is it's a dynamic process. Lots of good say so. Lots of people are weighing in. And I'm not frustrated by it. Uh, but it is so annoying when the media really doesn't want to get into substance. Um, you know, you do hear some questions about Afghanistan and Iraq, but you don't hear enough about foreign policy and strategy and w- what are we going to do about Egypt and Libya and Syria and what is your plan and how does it differ from President Obama? You know, instead the media just goes over and over again to same-sex marriages and abortion, and they love those divisive questions, which i, I got to say, as a candidate, when I go around, people talk to me about jobs, and they talk to me about saving money in the federal system and cutting the budget, how it's going to affect them. They don't talk about the things that the media drives, yet through these three primary states over and over again, those are the questions that they know is going to div- going to get people divided and uh, I, that's what bothers me about it. Well, you brought up a great point. Uh, let me follow up on something. I didn't mean to go to this tangent, but i just ask you one time. Let's say you have someone who, who gets the nomination or the presidency who is totally for abortion versus someone who is absolutely against abortion. I mean, can, could the president, worst case scenario, whatever side of the fence you're on, could the president sign an executive order banning abortions? Could they uh, have an executive order providing abortions? I mean, how much can the president actually do over one topic like abortion? Well, they, they have, I'd say, two major influences. Number one, the judicial appointments. Um, abortion has, unfortunately, become a litmus test to the U.S. Senate on approving a judicial nominee, and not just to the Supreme Court, but to other courts as well. So, And those decisions we have found out have the force of law when judges decide what's really constitutional and what is not, and I think that they're as arbitrary and political as people in Congress, frankly. Um, but the, the second thing is, presidents can um, change a lot in terms of federal funding on military bases and other uh, uh, federal agencies when it comes to abortion, and they can do that by executive order. So um, they do have a lot of influence on it, but in the big picture, you're absolutely right. Nothing's going to happen without 218 votes in the House of Representatives and 51 votes in the U.S. Senate and getting major abortion legislation on the floor 
good luck. It's just not going to happen. We're too divided on it. Amen to that. Jack Kingston is on the horn with us for about another 15 minutes, if he can spare the time. I know you're busy. Let, let's get uh, back to Washington, D.C. if we can. Are, are you guys in session, out of session? I, I forget if you guys are in recess or just gaveling in and gaveling out for seven seconds, or what's the status of the House of Representatives right now? Well, it's really the latter. We're doing the gavel in, gavel out. It's called a pro forma session. And the reason that the Senate often does that in both parties is to make sure the president doesn't appoint anybody uh, during during the recess. And that way, you know, the Constitution says the president cannot appoint major advisors without consent of the U.S. Senate. And uh, what we saw last week, unfortunately, is the president breaking his very own campaign promise that he would never do that. Um, uh, when George Bush was president, he wanted to appoint a few people, and the Senate would not adjourn, and so he could not. Same thing happened over these holidays, and yet the pres- President Obama went ahead and appointed these people. Um, while I believe that the president should be able to appoint his own team, and I think that the Senate sits on appointees from both parties way too often, um, I do not think President Obama should have appointed these folks without the Senate's consent. And, you know, that's why he got all the criticism about the czars. And, you know, you want to know what are these people's philosophies. That's why it, it is in the Constitution. And it wasn't an amendment to the Constitution. It was in the main text for, from the very beginning. Um, but we will be officially going back on the 17th of January. We're faced with another increase in the debt ceiling of one point. Two trillion. No, that would be, no, that would be, no, 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 no more increase. You guys don't get any more money. You know that. Well, I agree with you. And I voted no last time, and I'll vote no this time. Um, it's uh, the one thing that is good about it is part of the August agreement was that if it goes up, then we will have a sequestration, which is really an across the board offset of uh, cut, and that. Unfortunately, the debt ceiling goes up immediately. The cuts take 10 years, but um, they will start in 2013. And it's, it, I think it's, even for Washington, it's pretty serious. So um, we're going to see how that plays out. As you also know, part of that is perhaps $600 billion cut out of the military. And so one of the goals that I have is to make sure that as we look at military cuts, that places like Moody and uh, Kings Bay and Fort Stewart, that they're um, not not hammered in a disproportionate way. In fact, hopefully they could capitalize on somebody else's loss. As we're looking, let's talk about the military. And I know that one reason why redistricting white was such a, an odd thing this past time around was that you wanted to stay with Moody Air Force Base. I remember that very distinctly. I mean, you'd love to keep Valdosta, which would be awesome. But you said Moody Air Force Base because you have other military interests in Southeast Georgia as well that you represent. As we're looking at the military cuts and what potentially might happen. Are are there any good scenarios here? And the other question I have, well, actually, let me start with this one. Are we in Iraq or Afghanistan? I'm, I'm losing track of whether where their uh, troops are deployed in one place or the other. Well, we are uh, officially getting out of Iraq and turning it over to them. And, you know, one of the questions is, I hope the timetable is more military than political, but I'm, but I'm concerned that it is political, because in those type areas and anywhere else, really, if you pull out too quickly, particularly after 10 years, then you're going to create a huge void, and that can lead to another Taliban-type group coming in, or who knows what the Muslim Brotherhood uh, may deliver. That's a group that's very diverse in terms of good and bad, and then... um, you know, same way with Afghanistan, we are drawing down. We're going to we're trying to get the sixty-seven thousand troops down from about one hundred and ten thousand. Um, you know, at the same time, you have Libya out there, you have Syria, you have North Korea doing lots of saber rattling, and yet part of the president's proposal is a fourteen percent reduction in troop strength in the army. So you would be going uh, going down from about. Uh, 520,000 troops, uh, maybe down 90,000 troops. Now, all that is a little bit sketchy, and in fact, my numbers, I don't want to um, say that those are completely accurate either, but it's a pretty significant uh, downdraw, and as much as we'd like to say we can fight wars from computers and predators and uh, boxes, 
that are hidden well away from the theater, you still need to have that ground soldier with a rucksack on his back and an M4 rifle. And so we got to be very, very careful about the, the troop reduction. Are, uh, how much of a mistake are we doing by not paying attention to Libya and Egypt and everybody else who just had the big uprisings in 2011? I think it's a huge problem because we don't know who's really in charge of Libya. And often when we uh, depose a dictator like Saddam Hussein, you know, we think, well, he's a bad guy and everybody he's oppressing are good guys. And that's not the case. There, you know, Saddam Hussein was not oppressing a bunch of Boy Scouts. And with uh, Gaddafi in Libya, same sort of thing. Um, what we're seeing in Egypt right now is the military has kind of held on and given the given stability and some balance and push for the elections. But then there's been a big pushback on the military that, okay, are you guys part of the problem or not? I think that I have actually met with the Egyptian military, and it was hosted by the, the U.S. Central Command. Um I, you know, I felt like they, they were moving the country in the right direction, but the electorate can get stirred up real easy, and you don't know who's behind it. It's real important for us to move beyond uh, traditional military and have lots of State Department interaction and CIA type uh, of information of knowing what's going on in these various countries. As all these things are happening, we have the military uh, thing, we have unemployment obviously still hovering around 9%, and it, it's higher obviously here in Georgia. There's all the problems we have with the economy, which I don't want to get into. Here's something i got to ask you as a personal question, and Jack Kingston, if you're just now tuning in, uh, Jack Kingston's on the horn with us from uh, his office. I've got to ask you this. A lot of people, and I'm going to start throwing myself into this um, into this category, sir. A lot of us are frustrated, not just Republican versus Democrat, I, I'm starting to sense an anti-incumbent trend that's going to be sweeping across. And you, sir, are an incumbent. Is there something that you see might turn the table so there might be the sense of, let's keep some of the incumbents, let's keep some of the Jack Kingston types around in November versus throwing everybody out? Because you know as well as I do, if things don't get solved and we're $17 trillion, $18 trillion, $20 trillion in, in debt, Everyone is going to get blamed, and we're going to be throwing out babies with bathwater before it's all over. Do you, is there a sense of that in Washington, D.C.? Uh, I, I believe that there's a, a big sense of it. Um, I see it. Or, you know, I've uh, made comments many times. You go down the street these days, and one guy tells you to start compromising, and why the heck don't you put your own differences aside and do something for the good of the order? And then another person in the same room says, why are you guys always compromising? Can't you ever on principle. So you, you do have, um, I'd say, a little bit of a schizophrenia in terms of the directions that people give you. However, what I think also we who have been in office a while have to make our own case and say, I'm frustrated. Um, however, here's what I'm doing as part of the solution. And if you like it, I hope you reelect me. If not, I understand. You might not like it, but I do understand. Uh, one of the few bills that passed this year, Frank, I, co- I was the author of it. it was the Agriculture Appropriation Bill, about a hundred and thirty billion dollar bill, and I um, negotiated it through the U.S. Senate, dealing with Dick Durbin and Herb Cole, who are both very liberal Democrats. Um, and we won lots of our things. We compromised, though. I didn't get everything I wanted, but I know for sure it had a big Republican, conservative South Georgia mark on it. And so. I believe that it is possible. Um, the other thing that I always try to do for the newer members, particularly our freshman class, is to show them that you can get to know these Democrats personally, just like anybody else, and you're going to have a lot better chance of getting something done. And when you disagree, don't attack somebody. And one of the things I have seen that happens, particularly on the computer with YouTube and blogs and all the ways you could track somebody and catch them in an embarrassing moment. Um, you know, it's no longer good enough to disagree with somebody on where he or she stands on the budget. Uh, you have to attack them personally and say that they're stupid, they're corrupt, and they're horrible. And, you know, Keith Overman, although he's not on the air anymore, used to have this thing called the worst person in the world. Mm-hmm. Yours truly made it three different times. Um, you know, uh, unfortunately, people don't understand that a guy like that is 100% partisan and trying to so sensationalize things. Not to say we don't have them on the right either, but a lot of times people think these are news journalists instead of opinion commentators, 
and they confuse opinion with really news. And it's very hard to get objective news these days because the commentators are more entertaining. <laughs> I'm one of them. <laughs> Final question, uh, Jack Kingston. I've got to ask you this, and then uh, I've got to let you go. Uh, just on the lighter side, LSU, Alabama, were you as disappointed as everyone else in the country was last night by the results of the BCS National Championship overhyped, oversaturated football game? I don't know. No, I, I was not disappointed. I thought Alabama um, was going to win. I was for Alabama. And the only reason is, is, as a Southern boy, Alabama is our Green Bay. I don't know if that was their 10th national championship <laughs> What? But, you know, if you're from the South, you should have a lot of pride in Alabama, that tradition. And, and uh, you know, I mean, every bit, Alabama is what uh, the uh, Packers are to the folks in Wisconsin. There you go. Uh, Jack Kings, appreciate taking the time. And, by the way, very quickly, what is your website? Uh, where can people find you for the legislation updates? Where do they track you down at? You can find me on just uh, go to Jack Kingston and you'll get there. I mean, there'll, there'll be all kinds of ways to find it from that point. But um, one other thing, I was in Atlanta yesterday, met with some of the legislators, including Amy Carter. She says, hi, she's hard at work. Okay, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> Thank you. We'll let you get back to work. Thanks so much for checking on the morning drive. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you so much. Jack Kingston there was it. Amy Carter's hard at work. Uh, settle her hash soon enough. Quick timeout, 753, News Talk 105.9 WVGA.